Welcome back to the Oxford Reading Hive headquarters. Um, I'm delighted to welcome the author of the engrossing Night Speaker series, which you can see in front of you, um, the creator of the Cola Club and the Switch series. Um, is of course the magnificent Ali Sparks. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming in. Um, we've got some questions, so I'm going to dive straight in. Okay, okay. Um, your book, your series of books, Night Speakers, it begins with children waking up at the same time every night. Um, what inspired this? Idea. Oh, well, it's been a number of things. The whole series was, but the whole insomnia thing I thought was interesting because I don't know, have you ever had an insomnia? Uh, no, I've, I've not, had a no. few spells of it over time, um, and it's it's weird. It's, it's, you go into an almost alternative reality state if you're awake for long enough and everybody else is asleep, and you you look out through the window and you see the quiet of your street, and it looks different to any other time you've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, there's something unworldly about it, otherworldly about it. Mm -hmm. And then you see the odd fox wander by, or maybe a badger, uh, if you're in, on the edge of the woods or something. And it, it's it's a kind of magical time. It's just not what we're used to. So I like the idea of setting the action in the wee small hours. And having kids out in the wee small hours, of course, is very weird and unusual. Mm -hmm. And need to give them a good reason mm -hmm. to do that. And so this, this waking up, continual waking up thing was, mm -hmm. was what I came up with. So thinking still about sort of inspiration, quite a number of your books have involved um, sort of feature animals and the com communication with animals. Yeah. Uh, so how have animals and nature inspired you? Um, oh, in so many ways. And so many of my books I write are just thing, wishful thinking for me because I'd love to be able to communicate better with the animal world. Mm -hmm. and weirdly, we're at a time around the planet where we all wish we could better communication and we knew what we were doing a bit better as regards nature and the animal world. And so that is a broad sort of spectrum of, it, of um, influence from that. But when I was, um, I used to be a, a newspaper journalist and then I was a BBC broadcast journalist for a while. And when I ever got the chance to do stories connected with wildlife or animals and creatures, I just found it fascinating. It, it, it just felt like a very natural place to be for me. So, yeah. so any time I could involve that with my characters and their stories. I'm not... I'm, I'm not what you'd call like a Michael Murpurgo style of writer. It, it's, it's not as as immersive in the animal experience as that. But it's it, it, everything I'm writing has got those little elements to it, the kind of connections yeah. with nature. I guess it's because I'm like that, really. Yes. Yes. I thought there was a lovely scene with um, is it Elena talking to to a dog and that we were thinking we're getting a new dog and I yeah. that was such a lovely. So it was very, <laughs> it was very kind of um, normal sort of thing yeah. to sort of be talking about, except you kind of feel it was a talking of a person, but it's like, yeah. that's like quite an, it doesn't feel odd. You know, it's it's very stage sort of where it, in a real, in it real world. It feels completely natural, doesn't yeah. it? And it always just feels like odd that nobody else can do can it. Do it yes. um, so they, they have these yeah. communications with the animals, and it is a kind of a telepathy. It, I mean, animals, as I understand it from the research that I've done for the Switch series mm -hmm. and for Shapeshifter and for this series, animals have a, a whole gamut of ways of communicating with each other which are largely non-verbal which mm -hmm. is through pheromones and smell and body language yeah. uh, magnetism the way that birds fly and, and uh, where they navigate their way around the planet there's so many different elements that they call they call into their communication with each other and mm -hmm. with the planet around them and i wanted to sort of tap into those and so i don't explain exactly how it works yeah. we just know that there's an element so when my characters are walking along the street at night and it's the early hours of the morning and they need to know something and they all instinctively after a while start to move into the shadows when there's a car coming but they yeah. haven't even seen the car yet it's just that there's something in the vibrations of the world around them that says mm, move over here it comes yeah. and the, the very insects the very pitch of the, the midges that they can hear on some level yeah. says oh, move over so it's that very instinctive kind of interconnectedness yeah. that I've really loved playing with. Yeah. Um, you mentioned briefly a little bit about research, um, so there's yeah. quite a lot for, for your series. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a couple of strange, <laughs> really <laughs> interesting that pieces that. of information you've yeah. uncovered? Yeah, and particularly for the Switch series. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the weird and wonderful things, okay. The, the ants, for example, are very interesting. Ants do like a sweet sugary drink, right? Um, as we all do, and they yeah. don't just nick it off us when we spill it. They have their own way of getting nature's sweet sugary drink, and that's basically aphids. Mm -hmm. So you see those little green fly things, yeah. and you see them on the stem. Occasionally you'll see ants running up and down, and you might think the ants are trying to eat them, but they're not. They're basically looking after them. So there's this little green aphid, and with the feelers, the ants are stroking the little aphid, and the aphid's kind of going, ah. <laughs> and out of the end of the aphid comes this blob. Um, of somewhere between wee and poo, um, and and the ant drinks it. Right. And it's known as honeydew, and it's it's pure sugar in, in like sugar suspension because 
these creatures are eating all the, uh, the carbohydrate out of the, the stems of the, of the grass and so on, and that's what they're producing, producing sugars. Yes. And so the ant drinks it, so they literally farm these aphids and they protect them from predators like ladybirds and things, yeah, yeah. and they look after them. Gotcha. So that's one weird fact. <laughs> um, scorpions is another weird one. Okay. okay. So if you are ever in a situation, and you might be one day, if you're ever in a bar uh, and someone brings out two, two scorpions and, and dares you to pick one of those scorpions up, well, maybe it's a matter of life and death. You have to do it. <laughs> okay. okay. And one of the scorpions has uh, got a kind of little, rather weedy claws, and the other one's got really big, big claws. Which one are you going to go for? Well, I'm mm, guessing. Do you know this? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I'm going to go for big claws. Big claws. And you'd be wise to do that. Because <laughs> if you go for the little claws, thinking that's not going to give you much of a nip, you're in trouble. Because okay. the ones with the big claws are much less venomous. They fight with their claws, so they don't have to Dude. really use their sting very much. So there's not much power in the sting. The ones with the weak and pathetic claws, they use the sting. And so they're the ones that are likely to kill you. So you choose the one with the bigger claws and you're more likely to live. Okay. So that's, and also the other thing with scorpions is that you freeze a scorpion in a block of ice. Yeah. And you leave it overnight in a block of ice. Come back the next morning, defrost it, it will walk away. Wow, wow. Okay, folks. So Cryonic suspension in reality with scorpions, they've done this. And so if they can do that with scorpions, how long before as in frozen in time, yes, actually yes. can frantically freeze people. Did you know that before frozen in time? No. Or did you, are you no, just doing comic, no. Is no, comic no. suspension? Suspend. Cryogenic. <laughs> cryogenic. Cryogenic. Cryogenic is about plant matter. Cryonics right. is about living the, um, human okay. and animal matter. Oh, okay. So you think you find out. I know. <laughs> Fact is so much, it's not more fascinating than fiction, I'm not going to say that, <laughs> um, but it is equally fascinating. Yeah. So yeah, amazing. Okay. Um, thinking maybe more about sort of real, not not classified fiction, but you find that you sometimes base your characters on real people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That's a bit of a, a mischievous laugh. Um, <laughs> do you tell them that they're in your books and how some what yes, sort of some you had? perhaps not. <laughs> okay. No friends and family and a few enemies over a ton of found their way into my books. And names are changed where they need to be changed. Yes. Um, so there's there's several teachers that I knew in my stories, and most of them are fabulous characters. There's, there's Mrs. Dan in the uh, Shapeshifter series and Mr. Tucker, who are both real teachers who were brilliant when I was growing up. Yeah. And there's some others in other books who I shan't name, um, <laughs> who kind of get their comeuppance for yeah. being quite unpleasant to me and, and slapping me and things when I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also my, my mum and dad basically are the, the real life um, research for Freddie and Polly in Frozen in Time. Okay. Uh -huh. Although Freddie and Polly are very much inspired by famous five style characters. Yeah. So they're very jolly hockey sticks mm -hmm. from the 1950s. Uh, and my parents aren't particularly jolly hockey sticks, they're working class 1950s kids. But their, their experiences of life in the 1950s yeah. um, definitely informed the characters of Freddie and Polly in Frozen in Time. And loads of my friends um, from working as a journalist uh, are scattered through my various There's yeah. Laura Trant, who's a BBC uh, news reporter and, and a presenter. She's in uh, my Monster Makers series. And, and Various other people scattered through the shapeshifter. <laughs> it's, it's just a blast. I just really enjoy it. <laughs> there are plenty who aren't based on anybody yeah. as well, isn't it? It's yeah. not exclusively no. my friends and family. Um, Do you just start, when it comes to you just start writing something and go, oh, that absolutely reminds yeah. me of that, and it's sort of just going to stick form, or do you consciously go into it going, oh, I think this is Sometimes I constant. do. I just, it's a bit of, a bit of both, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, and there are times when you suddenly think, oh, I tell you what, that's a bit like so-and-so. Oh, let's put so-and-so in there. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I give them their full name, sometimes I don't. <laughs> uh, there's a character coming up in, in Night Terrors, the book that's coming yes. out in, in the uh, autumn, ne in November, mm -hmm. um, who's a, an earth scientist, and that is very squarely based on my earth scientist friend who's helped me with all the earth science that I needed through the Night Speaker series. series. Yeah. So he, he, he doesn't know this yet, but right, he's, okay. he's going to be reading it <laughs> to check my earth science. He's <laughs> I like appear to be in this book. I've changed the name, but it's, you can work it out. Okay. <laughs> well, fingers crossed. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, your stories are, are sort of filled with adventures and close shaves. Um, probably in particular, the Night Walker, it feels like the kids yeah. are very much Put in them. peril in that one. Um, have you ever written characters um, into situations and then actually not known how to get them out again? Um, <laughs> All the time. Or, or are you... Do you do a lot of planning and you know how it's, how it's going to work? I really out. don't plan very much at all. Okay. Um, I really should. I, I think I'm, I mean, I do on a certain level. So obviously, yeah. something's going on in my brain. When I 
what I think of ideas is characters knock around in my head and, and you know, you're doing other things, you're going for a walk, you're taking the dog out, you're in the shower, and it's percolating through in little ideas and solutions are representing themselves. Yeah. Sometimes so you won't find that solution until you step away from the keyboard yeah. and go and do something else, and then it will come back. There have been times when I, I have painted them into an absolute corner and I just thought, what? Yeah. I mean, famously, famously in Frozen in Time, is a lightning strike that solves a lot of my problems, <laughs> which at least one other author has said to me, seriously, I don't think my editor would let me get away with that. And I'm thinking, look, it's not necessarily very likely, yeah. but it's entirely possible, and that's good enough for me, as long as you don't overdo it. Um, but yeah, you do have to do a lot of lateral thinking but you can, given time, you normally can. And if you can't, then you need to come at it from a different angle. But to be fair, that doesn't tend to happen very often. No, okay. you? So you've never had to, to just to... rewrite something or I have no idea not, how to do that. Not majorly, no. no okay. Not not in my early drafts. I mean, sometimes my editors suggest I rewrite it. But in my own little Sparks <laughs> universe, it's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I had a quick question, actually, about endings. Because um, this is the... Nightwalker is the... Third yeah. One. Um, one, two, three. One, two, three. Um, and just how about how you know when one when a sort of book has reached a sort of natural ending? Because yeah. um, I was going to say it's not entirely a happy ending. It's a sort of satisfying oh, title, yeah. but but I just wanted to. Well, you, you see, Nightwalker, the character of Spin, is slightly based on a real character. Mm -hmm. But yes. this is the character of Sam, who yeah. some people may have seen in a video that I recorded yes. with Oxford, yeah. um, talking about his real life um, condition of um, erythropoetic protoporphyria. Yes, <laughs> um, he, you know, and he really has real struggles. Yeah. So, Spin is not Sam. Sam is yeah. not Spin, but elements of what has happened to yeah. Spin in the book definitely come directly from Sam. Yeah. The, 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 the blood cell exchange that happens at the beginning of the book yes. is as almost as weird as it can be using Sam's diaries as well. So right. that's very close. Now, at the end of the book, it's always very tempting as an author to try and solve everybody's problems yeah. and, and make everything okay again. But the reality of people who suffer with EPP is there was yeah. no solution at the moment. And it would have been really kind of cloying for me to finish this to finish the book saying and it's all fine it's all right. yeah. you're doing great because it isn't you know um, and yeah at the same time if you stick with the series spin's sort of character arc mm. concludes in book five it's not really in oh, book so four be... to speak of oh, so but book five <laughs> okay. it, and it he's in a much better place by the end okay. of the series and, okay. and that's generally where i like to leave my characters i don't always but I so you knew to. there were five yes i knew yeah okay and yeah, and I normally have a at least a sketchy idea <laughs> of what's happening. I have to say, with book three, you know, I kicked off book three, and it's very much about Spin's backstory. Yeah. And they were <laughs> I don't done their first few chapters, and now I was thinking, and what else is happening <laughs> in the story? And I, I was in a hotel at the time doing a bit of writing, and I, I got in the bath and thought, what is actually going to happen in this story? And I'm glad yeah. to say, by the end of the bath, I knew it. it was a eureka moment in the bath. <laughs> um, sometimes you need to. It, it's there's elements of science fiction and fantasy in these stories, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and there are times when you need to be a bit linear and a bit logical about your storyline and not make it too out there. Mm -hmm. Just make it give it something which is a, a fundamental, like a kidnap plot, basically, yeah. is what's going on in this book. Mm. And you could apply it to something that happens on Earth, but there is obviously, because it's night speakers and there is this interplanetary connection, mm -hmm. there is an alien element to it. But the story is actually relatively simple when you yeah. actually pull out that line. It's all the stuff going on around that simple storyline about Spin and mm -hmm. about his character development that makes the story more complex and hopefully a bit sort of richer as yes. well. Yeah, great. Um, so... I was just wondering, this is something we often ask people, if you had three pieces of advice for young writers, what what would you tell them to do? Three. Okay, first of all, read a lot. Yeah. Um, because the more you read and the more widely you read, try not to stick to just one author. Obviously, you work your way all the way through the Ali Sparks books first, <laughs> yeah. but then try different styles of authors, yeah. because then you'll sort of find where you feel most comfortable, and that will be the area that you tend to want to write in most of all. And then just do it. Keep writing. Uh, write and write and write. And see if you can find other people like you as well, because I think it can be quite a lonely experience. True writers, young people who really, really want to write, there aren't really that many of them. There's many that like the idea of it, but there are not many that are driven through all the other distractions in children's mm. lives to actually sit down and do it. Yeah. And if you are, you're a bit exceptional. Yeah. And then you need to probably maybe try and find a few other people like you as well if you can 
just to share your experiences, maybe do a bit of collaborative writing. Yeah. Um, see if there's a, any sort of workshops or courses suitable for young children. There aren't many yeah. at the moment. That's something I'm trying to work on at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can do that, that will that will help keep you going. And then you, you've got to enter competitions. You've got to go for stuff. Okay. Yeah. So because a writer needs to learn to write a story, and then polish it up, yeah. and then send it away and hit a deadline. Yes. Those are the three key things. So if you go to competitions and you hit the deadlines, then you will be doing those things. And then cope if they come back and say, we loved it, but it didn't win. Yeah. Don't just crumple on the floor and you yeah. pick yourself up and learn. know that that's, that's the process. That's yeah. how we learn to become better writers. Mm -hmm. So it's just shrug it off and say, yeah, that's what I do. I'm a writer. That's what I do. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And that's actually all we've got time for. Is that didn't have got fast. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> um, so thank you for coming in. Um, like, this will be appearing on our Facebook page, which is going to go to right Oxford Reading High for Secondary Schools, and you can um, catch up on some of the other interviews that we've done recently. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, which is at Oxford Ed English, and you're on Twitter as well. At Sparks Alley. If you do at Alley Sparks, it will go to a very nice chemist right. in Wales. And she's great. She'll pass it on to me. She'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Best she's get it right first time. At Sparks Alley. <laughs> um, and we'd love to hear about what you and your students are reading. And if you have any comments, then that would be wonderful. We'd love to hear from you. So, thank you.